there's a lot of migrant crime in the UK. We'll start off with this story. There's been an update. Did you hear about this? I did indeed, yeah. This was uh, Bwara Shosh, 24. Bless you. <laughs> very smooth. A man of no fixed abode from that very violent country, no fixed abode. The BBC are reporting because he's been sentenced and he tried shoving a Polish postman in London on the tracks. His name is uh, Tadeusz Potoszek. He was 61. Um, off the southbound Victoria Line platform at Oxford Circus on the 3rd of February. He narrowly missed touching the live rail, and he was helped off the tracks by a passerby. He's been awarded £1,000 by the judge at an inner London Crown Court. Shorsh is a Kurdish migrant. Uh, he had to use an interpreter to give evidence, and he claimed he was angry because the postman in question gave him a dirty look. So, rational, high-impulse control behaviour there. But also... If he's of no fixed abode, I think giving someone a dirty look that's homeless is okay, both morally and legally. Well, obviously you're not in London, fortunately, but there is a sort of begging cabal that mm -hmm. started up in London's train stations. If you go to London Bridge, you'll notice the same people there holding the same signs, and like clockwork on certain hours, they'll change spots as if they're doing shift. <laughs> it's, it's clearly a, a begging racket. Mm -hmm. Probably because the person controlling all the money that it goes back to gives them drugs because they do seem quite tweaked out. And this chap, what you wouldn't know from reading the BBC report, because they omit this information, is an illegal immigrant who's received asyl asylum in Germany and has been sleeping rough in Victoria Tube Station for months. And now he's going to prison, not to be deported. So we have to pay for him. Yeah, so he's still getting put up, you know, with room and board, everything covered, just in a slightly different way. If anything, this is an upgrade for him. Yeah, well... It's certainly better than Victoria Tube Station, a prison cell. Victoria Line, by the way, was one of the ones that had the most bed bugs and diseases on its mm -hmm. seats. So you could actually catch an STD by sitting on the London Tube. <laughs> Not an exaggeration. I don't think TFL are going to adopt that slogan. Mm, yeah, well, every journey matters, I suppose. Anyway, next one. Um, this BBC News report, again, omits some careful information. So this is the murder of Mary Ward in Northern Ireland. This was horrible. Yeah, it was. Um, the... Police service in Northern Ireland have confirmed that now the Republic of Ireland are leading the investigation into the murder of Mary Ward in Belfast. Uh, this is following the arrest of a 26-year-old man in Dublin on Wednesday. Dublin man to blame for this. Yeah. Wasn't he uh, a swarthy Dublin man? Uh, yes, a shade slightly darker than Roreg Nationalist, yeah, one, mm -hmm. one could say that. But, but the details, according to the BBC, Miss Ward, 22, was found dead in her home at Melrose Street on the 1st of October with wounds to her neck, uh, basically the police had tried to contact her for a welfare check for a few days and then found her body slumped against the upstairs window. So The problem with this is that if you just follow the, the news about this, you see that the governments give the impression that they care much more about the rights and the treatment of criminals than they care about the actual safety of their own citizens. Well, yeah, the, the, the left wing of Western politics now cares more about uh, rapists and murderers than they do innocent people this it, poor young girl is dead they're, they're not you know holding their breath for her they're doing it for this migrant that need not be there there's two reasons for that right there's the reason that you often point out stelios which is that this is a way of fostering anarcho tyranny it's a way of making the law-abiding public so terrified they run to the government for solutions to a problem that they have themselves created and so they get to expand the state power and then there's all the ideologues who believe that genuinely criminals are deep down fundamentally good and innocent people and if it weren't for the civilization that's failed them all the systems and structures and cultures and oppressions they wouldn't be committing crime at all so all you need to do is get rid of the police, actually, get rid of culture, treat them with kid gloves and give them a pool table and a youth club, and they'll just be right as rain. The and economic explanation for... Sorry, Stelios. Um, the um, economic explanation for crime is ridiculous because if you look at crime rates in Britain, for example, the people who are most likely to be in poverty, which, um, you know, the, the measures of poverty are questionable in and of themselves because they're judged on a baseline median rather than, you know, at, you know, any objective standard but that aside it's normally either Pakistanis or Bangladeshis that tend to live in the lowest economic conditions and they're not the ones out there doing the most violent crime at the very least it depends which area of course. it does if yeah you're in somewhere like Rochdale Rotherham they are if you're in somewhere like London it's not it's often second generation black and Caribbean kids who are not living in poverty in fact they're net tax recipients and have a lot of disposable income but they're still 47% of knife crime attacks cool. yeah but the point I'm making here is that the the people who are massively overrepresented in violent crime aren't necessarily the most impoverished, which suggests that that isn't the case. 
Yeah, exactly. No, uh, what I wanted to say is that some countries don't publish data when it comes to crime related to ethnicity. But even when such data are being published, such as in Germany, the only interpretation you're allowed to make is that this is entirely an issue of economics. So the only suggested solution people are allowed to say without being demonized as far right is that you should just increase taxes and just be a tax object in perpetuity in order to solve that crisis. And but it's not going to work because if that were the case, uh, there would be zero crime in, let's say, rich people. And there is. And, and so, at the same time, there's two things that have happened here. One, the countries that do collect this data, like the Netherlands, have found that both second and first generation immigrants have lower economic inputs from countries like the Middle East, North Africa, Pakistan and Turkey than native Danes and even migrants from East Asia, America, and Western Europe. So the second generation migrants, which are meant to be assimilated and are born in that country, are still repeating the mistakes of their parents. And also we see in the arrest rates, but also the economic contribution rates, that migrants commit more crime and contribute less on average to the economy in the UK, according to the OBR, that fire rate organization, than the native population, despite the argument being, we need migrants to boost the economy. A lot of the Scandinavian data in fact suggests that the, the longer a migrant stays in the country, the more likely they are to commit crime. So the second generation is actually commit um, violent crime at almost twice the rate of the first generation. Yeah. And so rather than assimilating, they're becoming worse, not better. Yeah, Ian it's Hussey, the opposite of assimilation. Ian Hussey Ali, an actual refugee who loves this country and, and Netherlands and the like, explained this as they're brought up with no frame of reference for the homeland. And so when they are raised to be hostile to the culture of, let's say, broadly the West, particularly liberal values like gay marriage and the like, especially if they're Islamic, they come to resent their home culture and then they they romanticize the, the country that they've never been to but that their parents came from. And so they seek to, in more violent fashion, replicate the conditions of their previous country in the new country. I have to add something very quickly because uh, I don't know to what extent uh, people know this, but it seems to me that it is a specific failure. It's a colossal failure to not be able to assimilate into English culture because it's one of the least demanding cultures. It's one of the cultures that demands the least things from you. It's just, you know, let me grill, I'll let you grill. I think that's actually the problem. Yeah. I think Harrison often outlines these things quite well. Integration and assimilation are actually different. Integration is abiding by the law and paying taxes and not causing trouble. Like you could say that the Indians and the Chinese have well integrated, but they still have ethnic and cultural lobbying bodies that get political candidates to act in Indian or Chinese, or in the case of Kemi Badenoch, Nigerian interests. Whereas assimilation would require you like Calvin Robinson's dad or Ben Habib's dad, to marry an English person, ensure that your children are partially English, ensure that you renounce your previous citizenship and fully adopt the identity and even the heritage of the people that you're moving into. And that should be quite a high bar, and we're not putting that high bar there, especially if you're marrying your cousin in a very closed-off community. It'd be like you, Stelios, grouping with lots of Greek people and trying to plan to, you know, impose Greek cult I mean, there are worse cultures to impose on us. Um, maybe you're going to suggest we retake Constantinople or something. The productivity which, would go massively. Which, uh, to be fair, I mean, if if you call on me, Stelios, I'm there. <laughs> yeah, it would be would be totally absurd. Interesting thing from, from this article from the BBC, though. We're saying all this, but speaking on Wednesday, Assistant Chief Constable David Beck said he was absolutely appalled that there has been another murder of a woman in Northern Ireland. He said, quote, too many women are losing their hands, their lives at the hands of men. Just men, again, is it? Mm. Just men. Well, Lies by omission, isn't it? Yeah, gripped media, as, as you alluded to here, Josh, um, after that piece on the BBC came out, they arrested the chap and named him Ahmed Abdirahman. I think that's Gaelic. Yeah, it sounds Irish to me. Yeah, he has, a, has an address on Dame Street in Dublin and is originally from North Africa. There you go. Was remanded in custody on suspicion of murder at Dublin District Criminal Court this morning. So, so not Irish, then. BBC are burying the lead on the migrant origins of this crime epidemic. And there are lots of examples. I mean, Matt Goodwin's done a very good thread recently. Here are the 10 reasons we must leave the ECHR. And you think, oh, it must be must be solid arguments about the merits of the legal doctrine. Um, no, it's just all of the so-called asylum seekers who have come over and committed murders and terror attacks, like Ahmed Ali Alid, the Moroccan asylum seeker who killed a pensioner who said that this is for Gaza, and if I had an AK-47, I'd shoot children. He's exactly the reason why we need the death penalty. 
agreed. Or Sak Ha Idad Ahi, an Afghan asylum seeker who was staying in a government funded hotel, government funded read us, and he um, sexually assaulted a 12 year old Albanian girl twice in the same hotel. Or this chap, uh, Shahin Darvish Naranjaban, a uh, failed Iranian asylum seeker whose mission to stay in the UK expired in 2015. He then murdered Brenda Bailey, uh, an 87-year-old woman. Lovely. And it just keeps going. Um, Azam Mangori, Iraqi Kurd, denied asylum in 2018 but never deported. He then murdered and dismembered Lorraine Cox, 32-year-old woman walking home from a night out in Exeter. Uh, our examples are just endless here. I mean, we've got the Clapham. Uh, acid attacker there, Abdul Azidi, good Christian man who had an Islamic funeral, um, refused asylum twice, committed a sex offence, still stayed here at our expense, ladies and gentlemen. Well, we've got another example as of last week. An asylum seeker who sexually attacked his stepdaughter won't be sent back to Africa so he can give his wife emotional support. What? Yep. What about emotional support to the victim? Come on. What about emotional support to society? We need a public execution. Uh, that is the only way this can be resolved. Quite. An asylum seeker who sexually attacked his stepdaughter avoided deportation back to Africa so he could give his wife emotional support. The offender, who cannot be named, why? Because he's a man. He's a poor asylum seeker. He's just a man. You're right, Stelios. He is yeah. just a man of no fixed abode. A man with no name. Yeah, quite. Uh, it was ruled that if the man originally from Central Africa, was removed, his wife would, quote, lose all emotional support and it would negatively affect her children's well-being. Who cares? Well, hang on. Did, did the sexual assault not affect the children's well-being? Does the wife also not yeah. bear responsibility for bringing this predator into her own household? What about the feeling that uh, people are not publicly safe? Are not safe in public? Is that, how does that conduce to well-being? Yeah, another thing that might make the public feel unsafe is because the Daily Mail put some interesting stats in here about the number of foreign criminals. So the last time I heard about it was from a parliamentary report that said we had about 11,000 here. They have said, in 2023, there were 11,940 foreign criminals. That was when we were the highest in Western Europe, and I think the second highest in all of Europe. It's now 17,428. That's just in prison. Bear in mind, we've also had over 140,000 illegal migrants break into the country since 2018, and all of those are criminals as well. And there's also the fact that uh, more and more criminals are going, you know, unprosecuted and are still out there. Like, think of things like the moped gangs in London. Very difficult to catch because they go very quickly, funnily enough. What, what about paedophiles? 30 paedophiles caught with Category A images have been allowed to walk free from prison. Just remember, this is a choice. And ladies. also, we need to bear to remember to remind people of uh, several presenters who were caught with Category A images, and they just uh, didn't go. Oh, this one. Yeah. Yeah. BBC Funny, right? employees. Yeah. Well, if we just take a cursory scroll down, mm -hmm. um, if you obviously see any of these, and images. the person who distributed these images to to them. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep, they all avoid jail Zero time. Zero days. Strange that, how none of the judges want to give them jail time. And remember, if these people, if you if you decide to see them in the local area, uh, be sure to socially shun them because they are child predators. But also, this kind of rationale literally suggests that no one should be placed in prison unless they, unless they have zero social circle because they will have people close to them whose well-being will be impacted negatively if these people are jailed. So... Let's abolish jails. Well, hang on, hang on. Have you Prisons. considered that there is someone who needs to be jailed here? Yes, uh, especially people who disagree with the agenda. I've got a long list, actually. Oh, yeah. well, what about this woman? Oh, she sent yeah, a tweet. Yeah, I heard about this, yeah. She is the wife of a Conservative councillor. Just had a miscarriage, by the way, so she's not having a good year. Um, she sent the following very ill-advised tweet, and I'm going to read it out, and I must disavow it, of course, because uh, it is a crime... Mass deportation now, I agree with that bit, set fire to all of the effing hotels full of the, mm, for all she, Lucy cares, while you're at it, take the treacherous government and politicians with them. Now, we must disavow all of that because we cannot endorse violence on this channel. That is a very ill-advised tweet. Should she have got 31 months in prison for it while all those paedophiles didn't? Well, was there any evidence that anyone did these things because of her tweet. Surely that would be one of the, the sort of burdens of evidence for the prosecution. Yeah, there's... I imagine that probably wasn't done, though. It's, it's hard to trace whether or not any of the, again, chaps who decided to commit a crime by setting light to 
an asylum hotel in, I think it was Rotherham, uh, had seen this tweet. So that would be the burden of proof. But fortunately, a burden of proof is not needed um, if they just don't like your politics. Mm-hmm. That's Because uh, another, another one that they meant, read out during the court proceedings was a report... Um, was it was a, an ex post in response to a Tommy Robinson video where she said Somalian I guess with a sick emoji so she got sent to prison for that as well that's completely unrelated as far as I'm concerned I'm pretty sure I and Hersi Alika would have tweeted that because mm-hmm. funnily enough um, Somalians commit a lot of crime in this country 72% of them are on social housing and for some reason we've brought in more Somalians through family reunification visas at the start of this year than we have chemists biologists and engineers from all other countries combined I don't understand why one of the poorest countries on earth, we need people from there. Just like, what they've got going on, magic. We need a bit more piracy going on, that's what we need. But again, it's the premise that if they just made contact with British soil, with British institutions, that they'd be productive and law-abiding like you and me. It's just, it's just the air in Mogadishu that makes them a failed state. It's absurd. No, it, it's the individuals themselves, obviously. So she's got to serve at least 40% of her 31-month sentence before being released on licence. Um, again, bear in mind, none of these guys got jail time for literally abusing children, okay? But this was pointed out to me by uh, a chap named Stark Naked Brief on X. Very very good handle. Um, the judge that did this is Melbourne Iman Casey, right? Remember that name, Melbourne Iman Casey. Because earlier this year, he also handled this case. This chap, right? Mohammed Abkar schizophrenic, sprayed petrol on before setting a light, Hashi Odawa, 82, and Mohammed Rayaz, 72, in London and Birmingham. This was all caught on CCTV. It was at a mosque. Um, Abkar of Gillet Road, Ed Gabaston. Don't think that's his, uh, his home address originally. I think he's probably from somewhere else and should be sent back there, but there you go. Was found guilty of attempted murder on the 6th of November 2023. At his sentencing, the judge said Abkar believed people possessed by evil spirits controlled him. So a genuine insane person, Mm -hmm. Islamist, guilty of attempted murder. What do we guess his sentence was? Did he get a suspended sentence? He gets to go to hospital. Oh, that's that must be nice for him. Much like Valdo Calacane, he will never see the inside of a jail cell. Bear in mind, during the trial, the jury heard Abkar told Mr. Adawa, I swear in the name of Allah, in the name of God, you will know me, and then set him on fire. Um, but the attacks were not treated as a terrorism-related incident, and jurors heard one psychiatrist agreed Abkar, who came to the UK from Sudan in 2017, he had paranoid schizophrenia. So, Judge Melbourne Inman KC said... Abka would be detained in hospital for medical treatment indefinitely until any consent for his release is given by the relative Secretary of State. So he can be let out. So we just have Sudanese schizophrenics. And again, another one of the poorest countries in the world. The, the la- one of the last countries on the list that if you were in favour of immigration, you would pick if you were rational. Um, which a uh, bit of an anachronism anyway. But... Sorry, go ahead. No, I want to add that uh, there is th- another aspect of the two-tier policing and two-tier justice system issue here because what happens in this case is that the judges who try to adjudicate and try to form a judgment about what happened and to try to see the degree of moral culpability but also criminal mindset, they, they are trying to establish what went on in the p- case of the particular case. So what seems to me to be a... A pattern here is that people who are doing, you know, committing crimes of this sort from these origins get ridiculously charitable interpretations. Whereas the kinds of reasons that a lot of judges may appeal to in order to say that some individuals like this person there has diminished responsibility are not reasons that they are willing to appeal to when they're talking about to people who are posting on social media what's very important is actually the so uh, yeah yeah what what i wanted to say is that the kind of stress the kind of you know schizophrenic or whatever the kind of moral or um indignation or the kind of psychological burden people may have when they confront their everyday life is something that it that it enters the considerations that judges appeal to in order to to get to say that some people are aren't criminally responsible but they they are routinely not appealed to when it comes to people posting on social media 
on cases of this sort? Well, it's very important to raise because the judge in Lucy Connolly's case accused her of playing the mental health card. Yeah. Literally what he said. So if you look like this, yeah. and those are your opinions, you will go to prison for over two years. If you look like this, and you're not from Britain, you get a hospital bed at the taxpayer's expense. And more at the taxpayer's expense, just to leave you on a really cheery note, lads, um, we have news from Kate McCann. The Home Office has put out a call to asylum hotel providers looking for more space. After a spike in illegal channel crossings, Labour promised to end the use of hotels, which costs four million a day, but is now looking for more capacity. Um, there was a parliamentary debate on September the 10th about illegal migration, and Nick Timothy, a Conservative MP, stood up and said, I've been going through Yvette Cooper's announcement about asylum. And she says that in order to clear the asylum backlog, she's going to grant blanket amnesty to 70%. And she's going to do that so that she can move the costs for asylum seekers from the foreign aid budget to the welfare budget. Because foreign aid budget is set by an act of parliament. The welfare budget, not all of it is. And so they don't have to report the figures on that. And to do so, they're going to have to give every single asylum seeker, failed or otherwise, every illegal migrant, access to claim the full spectrum of benefits. And this is going to raise the asylum bill by 3.8 billion a year. They really are some of the worst human beings imaginable, aren't they? Yeah. So we're going to get more foreign criminals. You're going to go to prison if you complain about it. And you're going to be made pay for it. I hope you appreciated that segment from the podcast of the Lotus Eaters. And if you want to see what else we're up to, you can follow Dan's series, Brokenomics. This one, talking about nuclear power. And if you want to see all the other stuff we're up to, you can always follow us on Twitter. Thank you very much for watching. And goodbye. Mm.